your broad course every other year, and we spend a day with Barry at NUI Galway, and he just fascinates my students with all the um, stuff he pulls out on the troubles. And anyway, um, he's so he's a wonderful speaker. Uh, but now I'm going to read a little bit to you because I can't remember all this. So he's an archivist at the Hardeman Library at NUIG. Um, he has worked on a range of archives and digital access projects, such as the Human Rights Archive of Kevin Boyle, which is what my students are fascinated with, theater collections of the Abbey Theater and Ireland's National Theater, Druid Theater Company, and the Galway International Arts Festival, as well as a number of ongoing oral history projects um, around social change, activism, and memory. He lectures on a number of disciplines, including archival history, um, uh, sorry, archival literacy, history, children's studies, digital archives, and digital media. It's published in many international journals and books on topics relating to social justice and information, memory, and cultural heritage, theater history, and digital performance. So please join me in welcome. Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone, for a lovely welcome, and thanks, Lisa, in particular, for this really wonderful and kind invitation. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and speaking to you today. A particular thanks to Lisa. Uh, great thanks to Gregory as well for all outstanding help uh, on the journey getting here. And it's wonderful to be an archivist speaking to you in my natural habitat of the archives reading room as well. Um, so it feels like a little bit of home uh, here in Greenborough. Um, I also feel that I'm perhaps a little late and perhaps some of my uh, predecessors in coming to Greenborough were from our Abbey Theatre that did come here. And they did come to Greenborough in 1932 to North Carolina College, which somewhat helpfully labelled as Greensboro. So hold the correction on this. Um, if this is or not in fact on this campus, would that make sense? This is this campus? And I we're here. Yeah. yeah. So I'm and that is wrong. I'm sorry. It's what? <laughs> we were discussing this this yeah. morning. I, yeah. I wasn't sure. So uh, a, a decade and a few years shy of a century later, uh, I'm glad to be bringing some Irish tea here. Uh, back to Greensboro. I'm sorry it took so long. Uh, but it's really great, great to be here. So this is what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to orientate you through this journey across Irish landscape and some, uh, some famous plays of Irish theatre. Hopefully not touch on Brexit too much. I even I mentioned that in my preview or bio about this, this presentation. Uh, it's been so refreshing to not be in the midst of all the Brexit conversations. We've been a few days. So who knows what's happening back uh, at home in the UK. I'm not too sure. Um, but I'm going to focus on a few plays at the Abbey Theatre, Ireland's national theatre, um, and also a cartographer called Tim Robinson. And I'll introduce you to all these people uh, shortly. So a little bit of an introduction about the theatre archives. And we are a multidisciplinary archival service, so we have fantastic resources in theatre collections. We're very lucky that our institution over the last decade or so has been uh, really to the fore in collecting these great archives and also putting the resources behind them to digitise them. Um, just from within the library, our own resources within the library. Also, excellent support from colleagues in the Centre for Drama, Theatre and Performance, uh, led by Professor Patrick Lonergan. Um, and we have great inter-institutional, um, interdepartmental collaborations there. Uh, other collections, like Lisa mentioned, our Northern Ireland collections are, are really phenomenal as well, linking back to the civil rights movement and the troubles in Belfast. But also we play to our strengths, we collect and we teach what's our strengths, and our strengths in the west of Ireland is what makes us distinct, and that's landscape and it's culture, it's language and identity. Um, so we're very, very uh, uh, prominent in collecting, teaching, uh, and collecting and teaching in those collections as well. So a, a rough few facts and figures here in terms of the digital theatre archives, and again there's many more manuscripts that aren't digitised, so there's quite a lot. I mean we're roughly a guiding figure of about one and a half million digital items and, and growing, um, which is a wonderful problem to have, but it is a challenge as well. It's been a learning curve uh, these last few years. A few faces and names to what was in the staff just before that. We'll predominantly be looking at the Abbey Theatre, uh, Ireland's National Theatre, which is the center image there, and it's this great big beast of a digital archive. So Ireland's National Theatre, founded in 1904 by people like W. B. Yeats, a Nobel Prize winning poet, uh, Lady Augusta Gregory from Galway, um, and the whole idea of what a national theatre could be for Irish identity. Really permeated from the west of Ireland, uh, even though it's bricks and mortar is in, is in Dublin with the Abbey Theatre. Uh, the Gay Theatre is Ireland's second theatre really, formed in 1928. Um, very different remit from what the Abbey did. The Abbey was about Irish identity, culture, the peasant culture of Ireland, the Gaelic tradition. Uh, the Gaelic was much more focused on European modernism, Mar American theatre as well, um, and it's still obviously very active today as well. Uh, Tyvark Nagolibe is the Irish National Language Theatre, so we were a bilingual connection, which is something we're very proud of and that's based in Galway, that's on the top left there. Druid Theatre, which people may know who travel uh, to the States and tour around the States a lot. The Galway International Arts Festival, of course, in Galway. The Lyric Theatre is in Belfast, a very, very large prominent theatre in the north, so we're again proud to be a, a cross-border 
archive in not just political and sociology terms, but in, in culture uh, and theatre as well. And some other figures like Tom Kilroy is the seated figure, who's a very prominent playwright, a former professor in anyway Galway. Arthur Shields is a figure here on the bottom, and I'll mention Arthur shortly. Actually, Arthur managed that tour that came here in the 1930s, and it's thanks to him we've all these great records of what uh, that tour accomplished for Irish theatre in the 1930s, um, when, when the Abbey was broke, and we're really coming here to try and fill the coffers a little bit along the way, as well as bring some great theatre uh, to, uh, to the United States. But because of these records now digitised, we have all these different viewpoints from the administration of Irish theatre, from the minute books, the decision making. You can see WBH's signature in the middle, um, this minute book from 1908. So we know who's, who's making the calls, who's programming, who isn't programming. And again, we have a great tradition of Irish theatre, but it is a male tradition of Irish theatre, and male playwrights. Um, and one thing we're, we're quite proud of is the archive is adding to this conversation that arose, especially in 2016, when the Abbey Theatre programmed this commemorative programme for the 1916 anniversary, um, and it didn't program a single woman playwright, or at least a single new woman playwright. It was one uh, quite tokenistic, uh, but still very important production of a play called Katie Roach by an important playwright called Theresa Dealey. But this spanned a movement called Waking the Feminist, and this really drove a whole new invigoration of what a uh, value needed shake-up for Irish theatre and theatre makers and programmers. Um, you know, uh, that's something that's been archived as well at the moment. I know elsewhere in Ireland, and I'm very glad to, glad to hear it. So this is all digitised, the Abbey Theatre. Many books are open online and transcribed digitally as well. But we get these, for the first time, these wonderful shots of these early Abbey Theatre actors that before we couldn't identify them, we couldn't have no access to them. And now we can start to visualise and populate these ghosts, almost, of the theatre that we know from our texts, we know from the published volumes of plays we couldn't see before. So we can start to populate uh, a bit of three-dimensional uh, three history of our Irish archival theatre. And there's no sound on that, it's just to play a little bit of a clip in the background that it's more than the text, it's more than the words on paper, even though what I'm going to talk about today is the power of words on stage. Um, but it's the sound, and we even took the decision to digitise the reels that this media was recorded on. Hmm. Because students say have no concept of what reel to reel plays were when news were being recorded in the 70s. So the media uh, of the archive is important to us as well, and it signifies um, even the time frames of cassette tapes to reel to reels in the 70s through the 80s. Uh, for people involved in sound design and the technical side of theatre and production, um, just those resources are, are absolutely gold. Um, and then of course the video uh, is very important that we can, in a sense of the, the colour, the vibrancy, the accent, the delivery of certain lines that you just cannot get from a text. Um, and again our students of costume design and lighting and so on uh, are very interested in those sources in particular. So the Abbey Theatre, again just to recap and bring us back around uh, a little bit. I founded in 1904, as part of Irish cultural revival, and this was uh, a really nationwide um, and ongoing project for a number of years, um, part of the Irish cultural revival, and that was grow towards many different facets, but it was promotion of Irish tradition, Gaelic culture, craft, literature, song and music, and theatre was at the heart of that. Um, and it was an idea born in the West by Lady Gregory, this picture there, uh, whose home, ancestral home is about 30 miles south of Galway, so it's very, very close to us in the university, uh, and the Abbey Theatre um, itself. So just to put us in a in an orientation of where we are and talking about Galway, city on the west coast, you can see it boxed out there on the map. And just to zoom in a little bit, the predominance of the place I'm going to be talking about will be slightly northern more than the very northwest corner of Donegal, but also the Aran Islands, which you can see just off the coast of Galway. Um, again, absolutely stunning and unique landscape of, um, of the west of Ireland. So this is what I'm going to look at today, really, this geographic memory of performance of language and what, what power is in those place names. And in particular, one play called Translations, uh, which is a play by Brian Friel, um, a very famous Irish playwright, but which looked at the standardisation of Irish words and language by uh, a British mapping project in the early 19th century in the 1830s, uh, mm -hmm. as part of the Ordnance Survey, mm -hmm. of where the place names were standard, standardised and anglicised, and how that had uh, really long-lasting implications for how we navigate our identity, navigate our archive as well. Mm -hmm. um, again, Tim Robinson is the name I mentioned. It was his map you saw on the very first slide. He's a cartographer, a uh, historian, an oral historian, a folklorist, he's many, many things, and uh, a really inspirational figure, um, and thankfully his archive is with us as well, and as a cartographic and a geographic resource that has so much to that archive and that legacy of, uh, of culture and of landscape, as well as performance. So I'm going to try and loop all these things together, if we can, uh, in this talk. So these are just some rough and ready phone shots I grabbed just before I left, sorry they're not of uh, too great a high quality, with some lighting um, layer. These are uh, little water sketches by Jack B. Yeats, so the brother of William Butler Yeats. And Jack is a very prominent artist, one of the most celebrated Irish artists of the 20th century. 
And these hang in our reading room, in our, in our archives reading room. And there's about nine of them all together, and it's called the Galway Sketchbook. Um, and you can see <coughs> images of horses and fairs that are in all these shots. It's like the historic Galway races that still happen today. Um, but what's curious is that in the very next one, what suddenly appears on the far right is the American flag. You can see the stars and stripes on the far right. And this idea of culture transmission across borders, be it across the islands from the mainland or from the UK into Ireland, and all we talk about nowadays is Brexit and borders and soft borders and hard borders, whatever <laughs> these things mean nowadays. Um, if we even look at how the direction the flag is blowing, the wind is blowing from the east and the flag is blowing towards the west, that's no accident. I mean, Irish culture and Irish theatre is hugely influenced by American culture and American theatre as well. Uh, and when this was drawn in 1908, uh, at Jack the Age, was certainly doing that deliberately. So, in 1935, uh, Jack's brother, William Butler Yeats, the Nobel Prize winning poet, co-founder of the Abbey Theatre and others, wrote a poem called The Man in the Echo. Uh, and in that poem, he had a line that read, Did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? And the play he refers to is Kathleen Houlihan, who's no relation to um, my dad. <laughs> yeah. um, the shooting he mentions is, of course, the 1916 Rising in Dublin. Um, and Kathleen Houlihan was a very powerful piece. It was propaganda, really of an old uh, haggard crone who arrives unannounced to a house somewhere in, in Ireland, typically in the west of Ireland, unannounced. Um, she arrives to the house on the eve of a wedding, and the groom who is to be married greets her, and she is wailing and lamenting with grief, this loss of her four green fields, or the loss, sorry, the loss of her four sons, which sig signify the four provinces of Ireland, the four green fields. So it's a very short piece, it's a one-act play, and at the end of the play, through their conversations and through the, the persuasion of Kathleen, uh, the son leaves, he abandons his plans for a wedding, and departs to really defend Ireland and perhaps to go up and die for Ireland. So this was the, the significance of the play. But at the end of it, as the sun is departing, Kathleen was suddenly magically transformed to where it, it says in the text she has the walk of a queen. And the hunch and the haggard figure that she embodied uh, is gone. And this kind of magical transformation, and of course Yeats was very interested in the, in the occult, uh, it featured in a lot of these plays, is really transformation through language. It's transformation through uh, identity and native Irish culture. Um, Another play that people might know of, and just to come back to it quickly, is the Playboy of the Western World, another great founding play of the Irish canon by James Singh, um, which is really a play of, about fake news before it was such a thing. <laughs> so for people who don't know the play, uh, Christy Mahan is the Playboy, this exotic figure who again enters dramatically into the she Bean, this little unlicensed drinking house uh, in the west of Ireland. Um, so premiered in 1907. Um, and it's a play of Christy Mahan, the Playboy, who's on the run, and he... And he he transforms everyone in and captivates them with his story. But he's on the run after killing his father. And even though this sounds terrible, if he's a criminal on the run, he simply uh, is this exotic figure. And Peggy Mike is the daughter of the publican. And it's again, she happens to be also be married. And she captivates him. And she's married, or is, is to be married to Sean Kyo, a meek and feeble character. And that power of language comes out of Peggy Mike towards Sean Kyo, which she desperately asks him at the end, have you no fine words in you at all, Sean Kyo? as this poetic and rhetoric is coming out of Christy the Playboy, uh, filling her full of lies, ultimately, but filling her full of stories, at least. But again, this play was met with riots in Dublin, um, <laughs> typically because it simply mentions uh, women standing, drifts of women standing in their shifts, which was vernacular slang for nightdresses or underwear. But in 1907 Ireland, Holy Catholic Ireland, this was not <laughs> happening on the national <laughs> stage. So typically, and of course, the Abbey was full of riots in its early days. Um, and we get some press cuttings here from the archive. I mean, just see what it was like to, uh, without any photographs from that time, thankfully there is caricatures of the DMP, the Dublin Metropolitan Police, lining the theatre uh, at the time <coughs> in 1907. Um, and even on the top right you can see it just alluding to this new Irish play. Is this really Ireland? Is this new, a new modern republic that has women <coughs> like this depicted on this national stage? Uh, and I really like this one on the bottom left. The Connachtman Indignant. So this Connacht is the province where Galway is. So I can imagine everyone in Galway absolutely appalled at its, at its hometown being libeled like this. And they called it a libel on the West, um, the Playboy production. Um, so it's a really famous production. And people may know Ruth Negga, today, who's gone on to great and good things uh, in, in film. And this is her in a Drew Theatre production of the Playboy. But again, it responses that, uh, that slur uh, or that libel through language. And this is the map of Arthur's tour. So I mentioned Arthur Shields managing that tour to the United States in the 1930s. And you can see it was really uh, a huge feat, a huge undertaking, and it was a coast to coast tour. Um, but yet, yeah, it started in, in uh, unsurprisingly, the likes of New York and Boston, where you have a large Irish American population. 
So they played it safe at the start. Fill the coffers, let's play to the diaspora and put on the classics. At that stage, we know where they were each night for Art of Art We know the root books, so we can trace where they were. And we have the box office accounts, we have the press uh, newspaper reports. So we know what's happening, we know what's going down well with the locals in different cities, different cities along the way. In New York, it doesn't all go to plan, surprisingly. And this letter from Yates himself really spells it out. And he writes to My Dear Shields, and he says, I'm strongly of the opinion it would be better as far as possible to drop Words Upon the Window Pane out of the American Red. Now, Words Upon the Window Pane is a play by Yates that is a play by a seance of a group of people who are trying to contact the spirit of Jonathan Swift, so the author of Gulliver's Travels. Uh, and Yates continues, it requires a greater knowledge and interest in Swift and his works than you are likely to find in any audience here. <laughs> uh, I imagine the people here know of him merely as the author of Gulliver. Now, that's merely, that's not a bad thing if you're merely known as the author of Gulliver's Travels to begin with. But yet, that translation of culture sometimes doesn't translate across all the way to certain audiences. Um, a single letter, I think, tells us very much. It tells us a little bit of insecurity there from Yeats, which doesn't happen too often. It also tells us he was kind to himself by putting himself up in the Waldorf Astoria, <laughs> even though when the Abbey was broke, uh, he puts himself in a very fine hotel in New York. But we get a sense of the audience, and what the video recordings later on tell us an awful lot about the nervous laughter of the audience, or the, you know, the kind of belly laughter of an audience, or the gasps, or the shrieks sometimes in, the, in an audience when certain scenes are played out. But before all that, when we go back to the 30s, you know, what do we have? We don't always have in, insights to the audience, but when we do, it, it's very interesting. And this is from William J. Sullivan, so a good solid Irish-American name, uh, attorney at law uh, in Boston, 1933. And he writes to Arthur Shields, manager of the Abbey Players, um, who are currently residing in Holly Street Theatre in Boston. And the rap the Playboy, he's, this, this William Sullivan is kind of wrong in how he describes it. We, we know he's at the Playboy by his description. Um, but he says, I was enjoying the show immensely until the entrance of the Miller in the last act. And his utterance of that blasphemous expression and its repetition shocked me, as well as all those surrounding me, and I left the theatre in disgust. <laughs> and he also goes on to say in his first paragraph, I have not enjoyed an afternoon in the theatre as much in years. <laughs> so even though he walked out in disgust, he still really loved it. Yeah. So there's no such thing as bad press. This is something that was really interesting to us. Um, Tuskegee, Alabama, generally didn't mean too much to us as a location. We might know it at the top of our head as a place, but the social and cultural history of the institution, we didn't really have too much insight. Um, but we came across these photographs and the programs. Again, this is probably not long after they were in Carolina as well. Um, so they played a matinee uh, as well as an evening performance. And Arthur writes back to Dublin about the segregated, segregated audience that came to the production in, in Tuskegee. And it was really remarkable that in New York, Yates was worried that the Irish Americans wouldn't get his plays. Yet, Arthur writes back to Dublin and says, the audience in Tuskegee were the single warmest audience on the whole tour. So they were physically dancing and rolling in the eyes, laughing at these comedies. And these were middle-class drawing room comedies uh, by people like Lennox Robinson, you know, really stalwart Abbey playwrights at the time. But you would think, at least there should be no prior knowledge of these plays by the time they got to Alabama. We, we, as we've researched, that's what we can find out. But yet, and the archive tells us something different, that translation sometimes can just happen naturally and organically. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't happen to be a diasporic uh, audience at all. So that brings us back to, in a round circle, back to translations, uh, Brian Freed's play and Famine. I probably won't put in Famine too much. Um, it's it's a, in the backdrop to translations. The, obviously the Great Famine uh, of Ireland in the, in the mid-19th century, in the 1840s, is this catastrophic event that forever changed the demographic makeup of the country, uh, linguistic makeup of the country, with the destruction really, the final really destruction of the Irish language as its main, uh, main language of the people. Um, a million, you know, roughly speaking, a million people died from starvation, a million immigrated, um, so it had huge catastrophic effects, specifically in the west of Ireland. And it's interesting those years, it's also when UI Galway was founded in 1849, so okay. and a university grew in the west of Ireland uh, in those years. Uh, and it was of course Queen's College Galway in those days, as well as given a patent by, by Queen Victoria. But when we talk about translations, and um, just before that, and there's a, an Irish scholar and philosopher, an academic, Richard Carney, uh, and he talks about this development of modern Irish drama as a form of authentic verbal and a linguistic um, uh, structure. And he talks about the verbal uh, and dialogue and the verse and the poetic in Irish drama. And he says, and I quote, this indigenous movement of verbal theatre boasts an august lineage extending from Oliver Goldsmith to G.B. Shaw to James Singh to Yeats, Sean O'Casey, um, and to such contemporary dramatists as Brian Friel uh, and Tom Murphy. So all these authors share a common concern with the place of language. They've created plays where words tend to predetermine the character, the plot, and the action. So that's Carney's take of things. 
And it's not just these two plays that do that. I mean, Friel is a linguist as much as a playwright. In a, in a later work of his in 1975, uh, a play called Volunteers, there's a group of political prisoners in the north of Ireland. Um, and again, it's loosely in the backdrop of the Troubles. It's, it's a very, very interesting piece. And as part of their, I suppose, community service as, as being political prisoners, they're, they're on an archaeological dig in the city. And they've uncovered a skeleton. And these two guys, these two prisoners, Keeney and Knox, are simply chatting to each other, trying to guess, and they're kind of joking about how this bunch of bones in front of them may have previously met uh, their bodily demise. And what they can come up with was, maybe he was a victim of language. Um, being, and that has certain connotations. Being in the era, it was spoken in the 70s in, Dol in Belfast, being a victim of language was not uncommon, because you could be isolated, perhaps not isolated, but identified by your roots, your community, whether you're Protestant or Catholic, from East Belfast or West Belfast, by accent. Um, so being a victim of language um, speaks to that very much. So just by a very brief bio, um, on, for, uh, for those who don't know, Brian Friel or Tom Murphy. So Friel was born in County Tyrone in Northern Ireland in 1929 and died in 2015. And Tom Murphy was born in 1935 in Shoes in County Galway. And Tom Murphy sadly died just last year. Um, I mean, both, both, both these figures are, are masterful literary figures and playwrights. I think it speaks a lot to the position of theatre in Irish society. Now, when Tom Murphy died last year, he was afforded a public repose in Dublin City at the home of the Dublin Lord Mayor. Um, I thought that in, in the midst of all the chaos that's happening around the world, that the biggest news story in Ireland for that week was the passing of a playwright. Um, and as, as poignant as that is, um, I think, I think it's, it speaks a lot. So translations, uh, what you see the play on the left there by Brian Friel, premiered in Derry, so not in, not in Dublin, and premiered at the Guild Hall in Derry in 1980, <laughs> September 1980. And it was the first production by a new, newly formed theatre company called Field Day. And Field Day's ethos was to bring a very new, urgent, very raw reflection to Irish society, particularly from a Northern Irish uh, context. It was founded by Brian Friel himself and Stephen Ray. Maybe I'm not sure if people might know the name of Stephen Ray. Uh, and it also starred a young Liam Neeson, who was also caused a stir in the media in recent weeks by his own words, uh, <laughs> language, and uh, various, various topics. Uh, but again, to begin this investigation of, of language and place, Derry is a, is a fitting starting point, because depending on your community and your background, you will call it Derry, if you're a Catholic community member in, in the North, or from Derry, or you will call it London Derry, if you're a loyalist, uh, or a Protestant perhaps. So even uh, its own identity is, is dual, and uh, you can identify yourself uh, quite easily, depending on how you call it, Derry or London Derry. Uh, and in 2013, when Derry had a designation of being the UK City of Culture, they had to compromise this somehow. Is it Derry, the UK City of Culture, or London Derry? So they had to compromise, and it was called Legendary. Um, so it worked for that time, and it got them out of, uh, out of a jam. <laughs> but both translations and famine as two plays speak to this recalibration of a country, a people, a language, a landscape, and a tradition of culture. Uh, and both plays explore the formative events of the shaping of modern Ireland from the 19th century on, uh, including, of course, the Great Famine uh, and, and the, the aftermath of that. But both plays are less about historical events. They're not documentaries. They're not designed to give us a history lesson. And it's more about the psychological fallout um, of, of uh, documentation of where we've come from and how we remember that and how we embody place uh, in the place names in which we talk of uh, where we come from. So the whole premise of translations as a play uh, is rooted in how we communicate. Uh, how do we talk to each other? How do we talk to those whose heritage we don't share? How do we talk to those who don't understand us at all? Um, and it, it was quite a clever device in the play that the Irish characters are understood to be speaking Irish, even though the actors are speaking English. So the audience only hear English in the play. The English characters are speaking English, and obviously they are understood to be speaking English. But they can't understand each other in the play, so the characters are just blindly and dumbly kind of flailing at each other linguistically trying to understand each other. Um, and it's a really, really clever piece. And I'm going to show some clips of it shortly as well. So the setting of it is in County Donegal, and Friel sets all his plays in this one fictional place called Bally Beg. Um, and that's an, a, an anglicization of Bally of Yog, small village. So it's just literally a microcosm. It's just, it's a microcosm of what Ireland is uh, in Donegal in the 1830s. And at that time, in 1833, the first Royal Ordnance Survey was underway, which was a systematic mapping of Ireland by British authorities to translate local Gaelic place names into English. So a standardization and an approximation uh, of sound. And it was all done phonetically. There was no consideration of what history was tied up in that place name, or what it signified, or what folklore was tied up in a place name that had been carried on across generations. So it was really uh, purely about phonetics and getting things anglicized uh, as quickly as possible. But where it's set is significant. So it's in a hedge school. 
And what that is was it's an open air school. It was in ditches, there were in hedges, there were in sheds and barns. Again, it was a throwback to again just colonial legacies in Ireland from the 17th century, where the practice of education through Irish was forbidden, the ownership of land was forbidden. Uh, and again, it represents that these schools through Irish were literally operated where they could. The characters in the play, uh, Hugh is the schoolmaster, so a position of power and learning within the play. His son is Manus, uh, and he's waiting to really inherit the role of the schoolmaster from his aging father, Hugh. So Hugh's other son, and Manus's brother, is Owen, and he returns to Ballybeg after a number of years of schooling in Dublin, true English, and he actually returns with the uh, bombshell that he's now part of the, tr of the translation team of the British authorities, so he is the translator. And just to move forward there, um, again, a poster from an Abbey Theatre production of the play. But Hugh says, and he's trying to explain his son's new role, he gives names to places. Um, yeah. The dear sense of dread in his tone as well. But Owen kind of shows you his mind frame, and again, the psychologically moving beyond being part of the peasant Irish culture. Owen sees himself now as, my job is to translate the quaint, archaic tongue you people insist on speaking into the king's good English. Um, and again, there's solace in this folklore. I mean, it's all about place names. They're huddled over maps and places, and people enter and come out of the play talking about the past Croc Mona, for instance, uh, which is the turn of um, the bog. So Mona is bog in, our, in, in Irish, um, where the soldiers are making their maps, and the sweet smell enter it. The sweet smell, the rotting stalks of the sweet smell, and this is an allusion to the Irish famine that would be coming within a few years down the line. And that was the real signifier of potato blight, was the sweet smell. And it had a very sweet smell, but that was the stalks and the potatoes physically rotting. But yet there was significance, and there was faith in that. No matter the evidence that was physically in front of them, they could smell the blight happening. But yet they returned to folklore and said, did the potatoes ever fail in Bolly or Beog? Never, never. The same column kill predicted they would never fail in Bolly or Beog. I think there was, there was solace in that. There was, there was uh, peace, even though a certain um, starvation and, and, uh, and death was only down the, down the line. So this is just to come back with an idea of, in, a, in terms of the theatre arc of a making figures three-dimensional from the archive. We don't have a lot of records from a lot of these plays. Uh, a scholar called Anne Ubersfeld talks about this, when we create figures from spaces, and theatrical spaces, one area where that happens, um, it becomes almost a counterpoint to reality, this dramatic space of the archive. So we see the translation happening live throughout the play, and Canuck Bawn becomes Knock Bawn, or directly translated in as Fair Hill. Um, so these are all just approximations, and these are just examples of Bun Lahawan, which means um, Bun Lahawan is entrance of mouth of the river. I'm trying to translate it in my head live here. <laughs> and it becomes Ban Owen and Bin Hona and Bun Owen. So they mean nothing. They do, that doesn't in any way signify the geographic place of where that place name actually relates to. So when famine happened in 1968, and that was first produced at the Abbey by Tom Murphy, um, he said, I wasn't interested in this history lesson. I wasn't interested in the historical crisis that the famine was, but yet in 1960s he was suffering a hangover that had lasted a hundred years. It was a psychological uh, facet for him still. He was still trying to process this destruction of the Irish place name and language. And then we go into the archive, and I mean, there's a few screenshots here from the records of famine in the, the Abbey Theatre digital archive. So we have a number of scripts from the original production in 1968, and I think if, if I could have a, a euro or a dollar for every time I was asked by a student when they come to a reading room, can I watch the original production of famine? And you say, no, because it was 1968, and we don't have a recording of it, and they turn on their heels and leave, and again, okay, we try and set things down and say, look, we have other ways and means of reconstructing these plays. And we go to the sound, and we listen to the archive in certain ways, we listen to the text, we listen to the actors' annotations, uh, we listen almost to the landscape, we can hear it, if we can't quite see it. And it's all about a layering of memory and performance. So this is from the actor, the stage manager's <coughs> prompt book of Famine itself. Um, and this is at the end of Act 1, and I'll just zoom in a little bit more. And what you can see underlying there is famine sound. And just around that, so we have a lighting, so we know what characters are positioned where you're on stage at any one time. We know the lighting that's involved, we know their entrances and exits. But we don't have any sense of what a famine sound is. And we do a lot of workshops with our students in a range of disciplines. We have an MA in Irish Theatre History and Archives, which is a wonderful group to work with. Um, but all our students in drama have uh, compulsory modules on the Abbey Theatre and, and related archives as well. We, we workshop this a little bit, and we try and ask, well, can, you, can we come up with a famine sound, or what, what might that sound like? Um, and we need to come back, well, your guess is as good as mine, but <laughs> in a sense, it's, it's something that comes up an awful lot, it's brief. If we can look at that sound of immigration, or what that was, 
perhaps it's brief. And we look at the prompt books again, and even what it sounded like on that one night in 1968. And one actor's scrapbook, or his, his script in hand, is underlined. So it's the character of Mark. He's underlined for us. We know this is Mark's script. The actor was Niall Buggy. And he gives his character a stutter throughout. You can just see it on the very top line, but, 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 is written in. And for some reason he does this, but I'm not sure you understand why. I'm not sure anyone understands why he did it, but he did it. And it just brings us as close as possible to sitting in the auditorium in Dublin in the 1960s and hearing that one actor's take on things. But Tom Murphy is signified by being a writer of sound as much as a writer of words. And another play of his called Balia Gongora, and that just translates as The Town Without Laughter. Um, and it's a, a really remarkable play, again, of storytelling of language and of place, of this fictional, this mythical town somewhere, Balia Gongora, which is an aging old woman in a bed every night repeating the story every night to her long suffering daughter. And she, it's as if this, this old woman, this bedridden old woman, can't have any closure until she finishes her story. But she never finishes the story. And that's the whole premise of the play. But for a long time, we didn't have a recording of this play. But there's so many annotations here. You can see the sound of the house is written at the top. Uh, even that Josie is nasal, if you can see that on around the middle left. Down to the bottom right here, sorry, my uh, bottom left, is that Mamo, who's the character in bed, is pole faced. So we can even get a sense of our facial expressions. But yet, we didn't have a recording, only until recently. And we do now, thankfully. And I'll play you uh, a little clip of Mamo, who's this old woman who's trying to finish her story year in, or night in, night out, of how Bonnie Gongora got its name, a town without laughter. It was a bad year for the crops, a good one for mushrooms. <laughs> Sorry, and pause it. can people hear that? Mm -hmm. yeah. The contrary and adverse connection between these two is always the case. So, you may be sure the people were pushing their store in the poultry and the barns and the primary produce are the greatest man of the world that is held every year on the last Saturday before Christmas in my home and in the other county. And some sold well and some sold little. And one couple was in it. Strange, you understand, sold not at all. And I gave business concluded there was celebration for some and fishing for licitations exchange. Who are not of the usual protraction, for all had an eye on the poor, inclement weather that moved. So the people were departed by whom in the other county and divers directions homewards, as were the people of the place I'm talking about. And they were only midland satisfied with the all. The folks on were never entirely fortunate, and did well mend them and store them no matter what time it is. Seven, That's Bolly Gangora. Everyone is fully excused if you didn't follow that. Um, <laughs> it's a dense piece. It's a it's a wonderful piece. Um, I mean, the, it's very vernacular Irish, colloquial and slang. Anyway, um, it's a really really great example of Tom Murphy's writing. Um, but to go back to um, translation, I'm going to jump out of that one just for now. And I'm going to log into the digital archive itself. I'm going to play something from translations. So this is, I'm, I'm logged in now to our Abbey Theatre digital archive. So for any play in the system, it's translations by Brian Friel, and you get a breakdown of all the categories of material that's there. So you have this number of pages of programs, of press cuttings, photographs, prompt scripts, and so on, right down to set design, videos, and audio. And it also gives you a chronology of production. You can click on any one production to see um, records of that play. I'm going to click on the 2011 production, and I'm going to play you the opening scene, which is of uh, Manus, the son of the schoolmaster, and he's trying to get Sally, this character who's almost mute, to simply say her name. As a play, that, even that, symbol, that symbolism of the play opening, of someone just identifying themselves, um, was a really, really powerful statement. The other piece I'm going to show you is the beginning of Act 3, and it's one of the, the, one of the British soldiers called Captain Yolland, and Yolland has fallen for one of the local girls, Mora, and it's a brilliant scene to show their lack of communication through everything but language. They fall in love and yet they cannot communicate to each other. Um, so we'll start off by just showing you the, the opening scene first of all.
are secret. Nobody's listening. Nobody hears you. On the way of this, if I eat that day, and I'll cope it at any. Keep your tongue and your lips working. My name. Come on, one more try. My name is Good Girl. Come on. Great. My name. They've stolen away at the end of the night, and they're just somehow through mine or through any sort of language they can find, trying to express. Um, across the toughest border of all is, is, is from an Anglo Irish perspective, and uh, someone who's from a native peasant culture to be in love with a, a British soldier was just impossible. Such a short scene, but it's great to see. Scarcely keep up with you. Wait till you have a breath. We must have looked as if we were being chased. <laughs> Man, we wonder where it's up to. I wonder did anyone notice us leave? The grass must be wet. My feet are soaking. Your feet must be wet. The grass is soaking. <laughs> Stop! 
It's really striking, it's really beautifully done. The only thing that, in which they can actually communicate with each other is by speaking place names. You know, the language that we're speaking, the one line that Maura had in English that she just recited back was that she was dancing around the main pole of, in Norfolk. It was actually Yolan's hometown, by pure coincidence. Um, but the elements, the fire, the water, the earth, um, rooted it all back um, in that sense of, 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 uh, of place. Um, to round things up, and nearly to finish off, to come back uh, to here. And it was that sound of keening. I mean, that's what we came back to when we saw what is that famine sound? Um, and it's a sound of lamenting and grief and keening. And if people don't know that sense of keening, it's almost this wild, uncontrollable expression of grief. It was very common in the West of Ireland for many years until it became almost unfashionable in the early 20th century. Um, but this is an excerpt from a program article when Druid produced famine in the, in the, in the mid 1980s. And uh, the article said, uh, famine is perhaps the most powerful race memory in Irish consciousness. So famine is a black memory to us. And again here is complete racializing memory. And it makes Ireland into this post-colonial status where we're now beyond the hangover that Tom Murphy had in the 1960s. This is the 1980s. We're a modern country. Famine isn't our traumatic memory anymore. It's someone else's. And by virtue of the time that it was, it was positioning that in Africa and places like Somalia, where many Irish missionaries were working uh, at that time. But again, it's extremely upsetting to see the family mentioned in this kind of context. It's a black memory. But the author of this article goes on to talk about the Irish family left, not, left <coughs> mark, not just on our, on our songs, but on our landscape. And that was that landscape of, of, of the sound of Keening. And it's no accident that when Druid toured this production, this is the map of where they toured. And it's from, again, the program in the Druid archive. It didn't move beyond the boundaries of the west of Ireland. It didn't move beyond the boundaries of the maps that Tim Robinson catalogued and created many years later of Connacht, of Galway, of Galway Bay, and down into Clare and the Burren. So it's a famine landscape, and it keeps the memory uh, physically embodied within those places. So Tim's archive is a, consists of many things, it's his maps, but also thousands of index cards, which he literally walked and compiled along his journey, collecting ordnance survey details, collecting oral histories from people he met, documenting uh, place names and uh, features of the landscape on his way. And my colleague, Ashley Keane, who's digital archivist in Kieran Hoare, uh, archivist colleague, catalogued the collection and Ashling uh, geomapped all of Tim Robinson's cards onto a Google map and you can search, I'm not using a screenshot here, but you can click on any one of those regions in the west of Ireland and Tim Robinson's research will crop up. 
And this is one of those index cards, and this is what our students came back with when, when I asked them, say, what's a famine sound? Um, to go back to and try and understand Tom Murphy's famine. And I'll just read this out for you. It's from the region of Ballinahinch, the main in the west of Ireland, so Ballinahinch Manor House, which is near Roundstone, about maybe 40 minutes from Galway City, in, right in the region of Connemara. And there's a slab in a graveyard to John Mann, who's six months, roughly six months, is a question mark uh, on the headstone of this, about the age of this poor child who's buried. And there's a cross bones and a cross inscribed on it. And Tim draws you the cross and the, the bones. And according to Willie O'Malley, and again, this is the, the oral history, um, Tom Martin's daughter, so the Martins were the wealthy, powerful family of this time of the 19th century. And Tom Mar according to local folklore, Tom Martin's daughter objected to the keening of women visiting the graveyard, and so it was moved to Battle of Fan. So the sound of keening, the famine sound, was obviously too much for this wealthy daughter, the landlord's daughter, to listen to. They had to disinter this poor child's body and move it out of the earshot. Um, I think that's leaving the mark on our landscape. And Fanon's still leaving a scar uh, on the landscape of sound as well. I mean, as Lisa mentioned in the introduction, we have a lot of archives from the troubles and the conflict. This single card, I think, is the most troubling thing I've come across in our collection, that the sound of, of grief and mourning had to be, be the, the signifier of having to move a, a child's body uh, from a famine graveyard. And then a few final points is about the Irish translations of famine, which must have been tricky to logistically do because it's in Irish, being spoken in Irish, the characters still have to signify that because you know, the audience have to hear it and they have to have a miscommunication as well on stage. It was a tricky thing to do. But it was translated in Galway in the 70s, and famine became Goethe. And that's a very literal translation of the word famine. So if I was to say, in passing, that I'm starving, I'm eating all day, I'm starving, I would say, Tom Goethe. If I was a victim of famine, I would say, Tom Goethe. You know, so there's a big discrepancy there on the impact. But if I was to fall and, and, and kind of scrape my knee, I would say, Tom Goethe. So it also means hurt. And it was a different way of embodying famine, that it was a physical affliction which again is slightly different from Tom Murphy's uh, hangover of psychology and, and the effect of the hangover in the 60s from a century earlier. But sometimes, again, in the archive, we also forget when we remember it. And this is from the inner, this is from the program of Famine in 1975. And on the left, you get these illustrations, which are from the London Illustrated News, directly contemporary to the Famine. So these are live, these are essentially primary sources of the Famine in the West of Ireland, where you have the scene of the eviction, you have this poor wandering waif in the middle, going through a deserted village, and then finally the scene of immigration where the priest is blessing those destitute who have some sort of belongings and who have taken them on the immigrant ships. On the same page of the spread, you can now contact family builders to build your new home. Um, I mean, in the 1970s, there was a boom happening. There was uh, social and upward migration uh, happening. And there seems to be no irony here. And on the scenes of devastation on the left, forget that. Don't worry about that. You're out for entertainment at the theater. You can also contact your angel and think about, you know, we need to have an extension on our house. Um, we need to have a nicely picked fence around it. Um, and also, I think this is very much drawing on this American post-war ideal of suburbia. Um, you know, that sense of a house as well. So it's an interesting influence. But that brings us back around to Tim Robinson's uh, take on things. And that's Tim right there. And this is a scene of his maps of Inish Moor. And what's interesting is we can place Friel's landscape <coughs> translations back onto the places <coughs> of the Aran Islands. You can just see Dune Ingusa, which is that fort, and that's the landscape of Friel's translations. That's Dune Ingusa, that's the fort of Inish Moor, literally backing onto these perilous cliffs <coughs> on Inish Moor. And I'd like to skip through one or two of these, just to show you one or two as an example, again, just from Tim's archive, about how the place names record the physicality of what happened. And this is a place name card for the, the area called the Vinegar on Inish Moor. And again, just to read this, so sometimes between the beach and the main road at Port Murphy on English Moor, um, according to Pat Mullins' theory, which belonged to Sean Connolly, so this is third-hand folklore coming uh, on board, that when the English came in, i.e. the language, the English language, not the English people, um, this fancy word, being vinegar, was used for the, to depict the sour land, essentially the land that couldn't be supported during the famine. So it was a souring of the landscape, and it's got simply translated as vinegar. Which I saw was absolutely fascinating when I saw it. Um, that is really it. I'll skip by this very last piece again. It was just to allude to what was happening in terms of borders and our memories. And when Queen Elizabeth came to Ireland in 2011, for the first time, she laid a wreath for the Irish who died in the First World War, um, who were very much unremembered in Irish nationalist memory. It was seen as treasonous for Irish people to be in the British Army in the First World War. 
And it wasn't really for any sort of ideological reasons they joined up, it was purely economic. They got a wage. And Dublin at that time had the highest tenement populations in Europe, if not the world, it was destroyed with the tenement populations. And this is just to make me think about that the next time anyone may be in Dublin, and from Galway, please come to Galway, it's wonderful, but if you're in Dublin, I'll just set this Google map for O'Connell Bridge, which is the centre point of Dublin City, and just think about how we remember in our landscape of our cities. So the Irish National War Memorial Gardens are roughly 20 minutes away by bus outside Dublin City Centre. We have to physically go that far. If we look at where the Irish Nationalists dead are, are, are remembered, it is a 12 minute walk from O'Connell Street. It's along the main thoroughfare. Uh, we geographically hide the memories we don't want to remember, as in the landscape elsewhere. Um, but it's again, it's an interesting thing to, to look at. We're in a decade of commemoration in Ireland right now, which looks back the revolutionary period from 1913 through to 23. We're in the middle of Brexit. Uh, tomorrow, the 29th, is going to be Brexit Day, and that's been pushed back by a few weeks, in, in, or perhaps indefinitely. So who knows when that may, may peter out. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. And I've been trying to orientate you through the archive of language, of theater, and, and uh, since the West of Ireland. So I hope at least I've brought you with me on that journey. Thank you very much. Questions. Yeah. Do you think that having the filmed um, artifacts will um, impact theater? Because theater is an interpretive art, and um, you know, for instance, if you had a film of the gentleman who um, stuttered. During, you know, so the the stutter is not in the script mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. He added that, yeah. and so I just wonder if the watching the film sets that in our mind mm -hmm. to the point where we can't be can no longer be creative around interpreting the text. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, and it's a big issue. It is actually in theater history mm -hmm. circles and in, in, in theater and production and the teaching of drama. Uh, Richard Schechner made the very same point, um, was professor of drama at NYU, and he published in an article that there's a problem of archiving, and especially in terms of video, that we're actually archiving too much, and it doesn't leave a creative space. I mean, that, that's a really interesting topic to think about as well. It's, it's a premise maybe of how we use the archive to teach our drama students in the first place. It isn't to teach them that here is a play, you can watch it, listen to it, read it, and read the directions, and replicate it elsewhere. But it's perhaps study the form of actors, or perhaps study the form of delivery, or diction, or accent. And if we can make that discrepancy, I think that it isn't about reproducing it elsewhere, or just mimicking what other people have done in really key productions or performances. Um, it's hard to police that, obviously, later on, and students are creative when they go on to work elsewhere, they'll, they'll do what, what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But at least we can educate them and show them this, you know, these fantastic productions from X number of years ago. Uh, but yeah, I see, the, I see the point that it is a, a tension about how we use the archive really to teach. Yeah. Did the Abbey tour of the US in the 1930s <coughs> retrieve the fortunes for the company? And and I saw on the program Barry Fitzgerald was uh, yeah. you know yeah. um, leading, uh, leading the company. Did he did he spin off and stay in Hollywood and then did the company go back to Ireland? They all did. They all stayed in they all <laughs> There's a book written about a colleague, a professor, who's just since retired, Adrian Frazier, um, wrote a great book, and it's called The Hollywood Invasion of Ireland, The Irish Invasion of Hollywood. Um, so, so many of them stayed on at that time in the 30s. There's a lot of them came back. Arthur came back. Arthur is Barry's brother. So Barry Fitzgerald is Willie Shields. Mm. So Barry, Barry Fitzgerald is his, his stage name. And he obviously went on to have a, an Oscar-winning career. Um, but they were all in The Quiet Man as well, you know. So they made those connections then, and you know that carried over back to Ireland. But Arthur went on to have a long career at the Abbey back in Dublin as a producer and an actor. Um, they broke even. It's in the minute books that I talked about at the start. They broke even, and they're still arguing the minutes. They didn't make enough money. You just can't please some people sometimes, you know. Um, so yeah, they didn't make enough. Yeah. And I just recently saw The Quiet Man. Yeah. Uh, again, and I found myself being charmed by it, and Barry Fitzgerald's drunken. Um, matchmaker and uh, all of that, uh, and then I found myself thinking about the stage I was in, uh, and and the stereotypes films like that perpetuate, and, and wondering about you know the space between the reality 
and you know Hollywood's depiction of it. I mean, do you have any? any there thoughts is. On I mean, the, the greatest exponent of the stage Irishman in America or anywhere outside of Ireland was Dion Boucicault's work, and he was synonymous with American theatre in the late 19th century. He was the biggest ticket in town, really, in the states, and he was Irish-born. Even even think it from the name Dion Boucicault. And these were very much pageantry type works where you know these were stage Irishmen uh, or stage Irish characters. Um, Barry Fitzgerald, I mean, he, he typified that to some extent. He made a very good career out of it by playing those roles. And both Shields brothers, both Barry and, and Arthur, were in all of Sean O'Keefe's <coughs> trilogy. So The Plow in the Stars, um, The Shadow of a Gunman, and all these other great plays where uh, uh, Fitzgerald would play that drunken character in each, in different kind of modes and different forms in all those plays. but. He was a great comedic actor, so he could just do that. He, it never, I think, stuck to him as being a, a stage artist, really. Um, yeah, he, he was a, an interesting figure to look at. And The Quiet Man did a lot for Irish culture internationally, but it did nostalgize that whole thing. It did for a very romantic view of it. And then years later, I mean, Singh was chastised for that in the Playboy of the Western world, but in more recent times, Mark <coughs> has, has got that same yeah. uh, flack from people that his pastiche in Singh and his pastiche in musical by creating recreating their work, uh, which is just state Irish, looking at the west of Ireland and the beauty queen of Linan and uh, the skull in Connemara and uh, the Lonesome West, those plays in particular. So yeah, sometimes it, it still doesn't leave people, they still have to fight those same, uh, those same battles. Have you, are, are you familiar with uh, The Ferryman? Which is, I which haven't, is, no, I haven't seen it, I know about it, but yeah, I haven't seen it. Okay, an, an English writer yeah. and an Irish play. Jez Butterworth, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's got mixed reviews, it's got... Yeah, I don't know enough about it. Um, I know a lot of colleagues have been to see it, and I should have travelled with them, but I couldn't at the time. And uh, it's a play that depicts an Irish nationalist family, and I think it's like post Good Friday Agreement, so it's a post conflict era. I think it's reverting back into those tropes of conflict and sectarianism again. But there is tensions around this English playwright doing that. Um, but there was also tensions of McDonough, as a even though as an Irish Anglo Irish playwright, even though he called himself a Londoner, I think more than Irish. Um, writing those plays about the west of Ireland. So, yeah, I mean, Ireland has a, I wouldn't say a love-hate relationship with, with McDonough, um, but it is an interesting relationship. It's an, an, an uneasy one, I think. Uh, but Butterworth's play, I, yeah, I, I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be produced in Ireland anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Belfast, anyway. Do you collect for textiles and artifacts? Sadly not. It's something I'd love to do. We have some odds and ends. And like the character of Mamo, the old woman in the bed, we have her nightdress. And Drew has just kept it. I mean, the actress there, I think, is more so of a, a gesture. Siobhan McKenna was her name, and she was a really uh, famous actress. Again, she was famous on Broadway in the 50s as St. Joan, Shaw St. Joan, and she really personified that role. And she died quite young. That was her last role. She died only a few months after playing Mamo. And she's buried in Galway. And Brian Free had actually delivered the graveside oration at her funeral, and he called her the idea of Ireland. You know, I mean, she was eight. she was this first big international superstar in the fifties and sixties when media was really taking off. Um, and to have that nightdress, I mean, the big role that she finished with is really something. And also because it's a, she's in a bed under a duvet. It's really heavy. It's really thick, heavy uh, piece. So she must have been sweating buckets every night in that bed. <laughs> so it was, a, it was an in performance of endurance uh, more than anything. But that's the kind of thing the textile can tell us. We're, we're just not set up for that. Um, mm -hmm. It's a thing we're lacking in Ireland. There was no Irish theatre museum collecting costume like the Victoria and Albert Museum does in London. Uh, but they're doing an amazing job, but no, sadly, sadly we don't. Well, thank you very much again. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Please join us for some um, snacks outside and a talk with Barry. And thank you for coming.